tonight on Police 107. A group of car thieves come down to Hamilton for a night on the town. We're with Detective Constable Mike McKenzie and a team of officers as they execute a drug warrant in Tokoroa. Good for shame. This is where we're at, mate. You're not getting your gear back. Why? There's not much on how old. Let me finish and I'll tell you. And we're on the trail of a burglar and con man operating around the Hauraki Plains. What is that his real name? Well, it's the name of a person I know. The swing shift are out in patrol in Hamilton when a call comes in about a car that's been stolen in a nearby car park. With their escape blocked by the police van, the thieves make a run for it. After a short chase, constables Todd Hubbard and Brenton Rooney catch up with one of the runners. The other got away. A search of the car reveals a wrecked ignition and some clothes that probably don't belong to the thieves. There's a woman's underwear in there. <laughs> the stolen car is taken away to be examined and the suspect's taken back to Central. In the interview room, it's soon apparent that the suspect, Jim, isn't going to admit to much. Who's bags this? Come on, man. It's got screwdrivers, it's got a wrench, it's got just about everything a car thief needs. Is it his bag or yours? Come on, man, you were playing. Look out for him. Is it yours? No. Is it his? While Brenton's been questioning Jim, another three suspects have been picked up. But none of them are cooperating. Okay. When you got down here, you knew that they were going to start knocking off cars, eh? No, he just told us to wait there and we'll be back. Come on. Start telling the truth, eh? Start telling the truth. Yeah. Take in a couple of minutes. It's some time before police can put together a picture of what's gone on. But even then, Jim's admitting nothing. Tonight he's come down from Auckland in a stolen car. Probably picked you boys up at Huntley on the way through. Is that right? What time you on the bus? When? Today. With who? Just me and my cousin. Come on, there's four years in the car park. Two of you stole this car. The other two were mucking around with another car, is that right? I've never seen them. Well, I was going to go with me and my mate. Eventually, though, the evidence stacked up. Jim pleaded guilty to unlawfully taking a motor vehicle. He received 200 hours community service and had to pay $495 to the owner of the vehicle. For constables Carl Little and Fraser Simpson, it's back on the road. And this Friday night ends outside a house where a loud party has just come to an end. Oi. A man has slumped over the steering wheel of his car and he's not moving at all. At least it's not that cold tonight, I guess. Oh. Eventually, Fraser Simpson rouses the man, but he's so drunk he can't open the door. Hello. Unlock your door, mate.
a few problems here, are we? No, don't, don't go back to sleep. No. Don't go back to sleep. <laughs> Unlock your door, mate, or wind down your window, one of the two. Excellent. Okay. Where do you live, mate? Me, Poo Kitty. Poo Kitty. Yeah. You're planning on sleeping here tonight, are you? In the car, uh, yeah. That's a good idea. The commotion oh, brings some of the man's yeah. friends from the party house. I'll take him up to oh, my you got house. got a bed, mate. you got a bed. Come on. Excellent. Hop out. Yeah, okay. him out oh, wait. Yeah. They'd earlier oh, removed the car's distributor to make sure that it couldn't be driven out, away. Hop out. Well, I'm getting down, mate. Yeah, we'll sort this week. You couldn't walk out yeah, of the car. You won't be able to walk now. You got your keys? Don't right. drive for another 12 hours, eh? So Don't want you drive right. home. If we can have horse and Neil. At Tokara Station, Detective Constable Mike McKenzie has brought together a team of four officers to serve a drug warrant. Just get, in, get in there, clear the house. The bully is that uh, there's an indoor growing operation there, cannabis. Um, not sure what size, but there'll be quite a few lights here, I guess, and quite a few plants. Um, it's a farm, rural area. Uh, it's the White House at the rear. There's actually three houses at the address. And it'll be the rear house, which is the, uh, the white one. The operation runs into trouble from the start. Cindy watching us. Uh, plenty of time to get really... Major roadworks almost bring them to a halt just as they come into view of the target address. It takes several minutes for the team to make it to the house, and they're almost too late. Hello, hello. The occupants are in the middle of moving out, and the indoor hydroponic growing equipment has already been dismantled. Proper hydroponics. All round the house, police find evidence of a sophisticated approach to growing. You've got a pH tester there, I'd say. Yep. Some sort of nutrients made up in your pH riser. He's obviously well set up for growing, isn't he? I mean, he's just pulled it all the bits. Yeah. Is he's moving house? Oh, is he? Yeah, oh, he's, he's moving out, so. Yeah, he's probably just between uh, crops. Yep. Eventually, police assemble all the equipment from the bedroom. This stuff here is just all the um, polyurethane that they use to, uh, to line the walls and that just to keep the heat in, reflects the heat, and it just hit, creates a better growing environment for them. Um, this, this gear here, I've just got the extractor fans. It, all it does is just takes all the fumes and, um, and excess heat as well out of the uh, area. Yeah, mate, we'll take everything to do with Are you the doing? Are you doing the exhibits? Yeah, well, we're taking everything. Right. So, yeah, well, mate. Nah. Grant, the only person in the house, is denying all knowledge of the equipment. Can we talk about the... Yeah, he doesn't know. He's never seen it, doesn't know anything about it. How long have you been here? Probably since after, just after the years. Oh, you know it was growing in the back room. You know it was growing there, bro. What about the other houses? Anything in the other houses? I don't know. Well, we, didn't, we haven't arrived here for no reason. You know, we didn't just come here because we thought there might be some old hydroponics in the back bedroom. Cobby, thanks for that. A check with Central confirms that there's already a warrant for Grant's arrest on shoplifting charges. Yeah, I'd seen it before. This year, have you been arrested in Levin or anywhere like that? Shoplifting? That's right, I went to for my um, court. Oh, yep. I'm not caught my PD. That's where I have my PD. Yep. What about shoplifting? Have a think about it. You've been caught shoplifting in the last three or four months? Even last year? Nice. End of last year? Yeah, I think it was last year. Yep. I had a little problem like that. Yeah. Yep. With the clear. return of Grant's memory, it's time to go. But before returning to Tokoroa, Mike McKenzie leaves a calling card for the other occupants of the house. This is a copy of the search warrant, the fact that we've done the warrant. And just on the back, we've just put uh, what we've took, taken in and basically to contact us when he gets back in, because we obviously need to speak to him regarding the uh, items found in his uh, wardrobe. It is disappointing not to catch him growing the cannabis and getting him for that. However, uh, the fact that we've got the equipment, our information has been correct and we managed to seize the equipment to prevent him uh, setting up again, or at least costing him some money. Um, but it is disappointing not to get the, uh, the cannabis, but that's how, you get, that's how the job is, and it's, uh, it's quite good just to get this. But the day holds one more twist for Mike. 
One of the house's other occupants turns up at Tokoro Station looking for his gear. You know, we did a warrant your house, eh? And we got all that, um, that gears. What's the story with all that ground equipment? Oh, nothing to say. Well, I want my gear back, please. Nothing to say and you want your gear back? Yeah. Okay. This is where we're at, mate. You're not getting your gear back. Why? There's not John Howell. Let me finish and I'll tell you. Okay? Yeah. You're not getting your gear back. We're going to be applying to the court under the Misuse of Drugs Act to get it all destroyed. Okay? Because I know you've been growing dope there. Okay, it's a simple, mate. You, it was your lucky day. Okay? You didn't get caught growing it, so there's nothing really to groan about. The man eventually realises his best option is to allow police to destroy the equipment. We're going to get all the gear destroyed. Um, he's going to consent to us destroying the gear, so we don't have to go to court. It's just simple that way. Constable Alan Lee from Thames Station is on the trail of a con man and burglar who's been stealing from people around the district. Yeah, what he does, he, he comes in, he was coming in here, like on a Sunday afternoon, they'd all be pouring out of here, and he'd pull up here and he'd jump out and... He'd go to the minister or, or someone and say, oh, I need some money. I've got uh, mum's just died and I've got her in the car. I need to give the warm away for the funeral. And... The man Ellen's looking for yeah. is well known to the local church receptionist, Heather. You know, he's not threatening looking. No. He's, he's sort of the man that can actually get money out of people too. Yeah, yeah. yeah he certainly has got the That's cool. Here. I'll talk with Harvey, maybe it's so. But just like he's, he's actually taken to quoting ministers' names, so whether he reads the sign, you know, he says he knows the minister from somewhere back. Mm. Yeah. As well as trying to con parishioners out of their money, the suspect is also an active burglar. The worrying thing about what he's doing is the people he's targeting, particularly elderly people and elderly people that are living on their own, travelling on their own. Next stop for Alan is the second hand shops of Pyra, where the suspect's a regular visitor. I'm just doing routine inquiries and after. Okay. Let's go here. That's um, is that a chap from Thames? Yep. Yeah. From everywhere. That's the guy that I gave information about and he ended up back in jail, isn't yep. it? Yeah. Yep. That's yeah. him. Yep. Yeah. No, I thought you'd recognise him. Yeah. You've yeah. seen him for a while? No. I don't think he would be silly enough, you know, to come back in here. OK. The story's much the same at the next okay. shop. No, I haven't seen him for ages, but he has been in. He's yeah. usually, he's, I've asked him yeah. before, he says he's from down the Thames coast. Oh, yeah, around about sort of away, yeah. Can I have a quick look at your receipt book? I just want to see if uh, anyone I know, or have you been buying, buying anything or much? Yes. A check of the shop's receipt book, something all second-hand dealers have to keep, reveals nothing suspicious. OK. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's good. Oh, if you see him. <laughs> yeah, well, definitely. Get on the phone. Know. Kick him out. Get on the phone. Yeah. yeah. We don't the people in the next shop believe he's been hanging around the local church. All I know is that when I spoke to my friend when this other one came out, the lady she came said, out. yeah, Diane, yeah. she said that he'd been around some time before. Yeah. So it could have been a week, two weeks, three weeks before. I don't know. But he had been around at the Anglican Church asking. Yeah. And the hotel wanted a copy of that and I was supposed to do it. I forgot. Did, uh, did you buy anything off him? No. The final call for the morning is to Vivian Howes. And while he can't help with the suspect Alan Lee's chasing, his register turns up an unexpected bonus. Yeah. One day, you know. I'm looking for that, the stuff. Makita orbital, Makita belt. You've still got the stuff here? Makita jigs, oh yes, I have. Can I just, I'll just get, have a quick look at it? I might just get you to hang on to it. Yeah. Vivian's recently it's bought some power tools that Ellen believes yeah. are from another burglary. I'll have a look at because I've got three of those jigsaws. He was only a young lad, I remember him. He came in Saturday afternoon. Then he came back again the next day with something else that I didn't want. And what did you pay for it? I've got, uh, I should have that written down there somewhere as well. But it wasn't just the tools that attracted Alan's attention. The burglar has used his real name and it's well known to police. But that's his, uh, that's his signature there. Oh, is that his real name? Well, that's the name of a person I know. Oh, right. well. Back at Nartia Station, the officer in charge of the burglary case, Constable Blair Mattock, confirms that the tools are the ones he's looking for. With all this gear that we've got now that Alan's found over in uh, Pyrrhal, we should uh, 
and the statements that we've taken from the people that, uh, that purchased them off our offender, we should have more than enough ammunition to um, to uh, put to them. Tomorrow, he is due to appear in court in terms for sentencing on quite a few other matters. Yeah, we'll oppose his bail, so he might get held in, in custody. The next day, the suspect, Lawrence, does get bail, but he's immediately back in the interview room to answer questions about another burglary. I've got some more information today to suggest that he's been involved in uh, a couple of burglaries. So I'm now going to go and interview him on and uh, see how I go. It's likely he'll be held overnight to reappear tomorrow. Lawrence finally pleaded guilty to a number of charges, including two of burglary, one of receiving and another, more serious offence, of demanding with menaces. He was sentenced to 19 months in jail. The church-going con man that Alan Lee first set out looking for is now serving an 18-month prison sentence after pleading guilty to 15 charges, which included traffic and property offences. It's Friday night and dog handler Constable Alan O'Donnell and his dog Zach have been called to a disturbance in the middle of Hamilton. Comes that off with the HLP. A group of guys have been seen breaking into an empty shop. But so far, they're denying any involvement with the break in. Listen, then you can have your say. I'm happy for someone to put their hand up for it. No one puts their hand up for it. You take your back to the station and the interview will be able to do it. Okay? If you have a pretty law, what are you going to do? If someone puts their hand up, we're happy. Okay? I won't give you long enough, I'll ask you to sort it out. But nobody takes acting Sergeant Neil Frey up on his offer, which means they're all going to be checked for glass on their shoes. One of them is covered in white powder that's also spread around the empty shop. There's white powder on all his clothes and on his shoes. There's a footprint here. Oh yeah, carry from inside somewhere probably. As they're looking for the source of the powder, one of the guys they've been talking to takes off, and Alan's quickly in pursuit with Zach. Good boy. Hop. But although Zach finds the track, it goes over a fence and into the RSA before disappearing in a busy street. Run past you, did you? <coughs> he's, um, I'd say, he's just, where's Russ? Yeah, he's, um, I'd say he's gone straight over the fence, but this bloody goes right into the back of the RSA and he's sorry, out, bloody waiting for their minibus. I'll go for a drive around, he would have gone that way, I'd say, so. But before running, the guy had given police his name and address and he was questioned later. Another person was charged with willful damage and dealt with through the courts. And a little while later, Alan O'Donnell is back on patrol. Yeah, well, uh, we're just going to a, a report of an unconscious male in a driveway. Just a young fella, seems like he's been on the booze and a little bit too much of it, passed out. And uh, the residents were concerned he might get run over. Driveway apparently leads down to a large block of flats. So uh, it's only just up the road. So we're going to work. Can't see anyone there at the moment. Oh, there it is. A negative. Can you just K1 at the owner's going to come back and report later? Hopefully he's just uh, intoxicated and not murdered or anything. Hello. The man is unconscious and covered in his own vomit. Oh, yeah, he's uh, had a bit of a chunder by looks of it. <clears throat> How long has he been there? Oh, okay. Oh yeah, mate. You spewed in your jacket. Uh, Wake up, mate. You can't be sleeping there. Just watch out. You got a whole lot of chunder in your jacket. 
Where do you live? Hey? Oh. Don't forget your wallet. There you But right now, Amal can't even begin to think about his wallet. He's still got to work out how to stand up. What's your name? Hey? He's obviously had a little bit too much to drink. Uh... Where do you live, man? Do you know? Yeah. Whereabouts? Uh... Do you know what number? That's just down, down here, mate. We might have to walk you home. Don't, don't touch me because you're covered in uh, vomit. Walk out to the road out there, eh? Having only just grasped how to stand, the idea of walking takes a few moments to sink in. All right. You've been, you're asleep in the driveway. You'll get run over. He lives, um, just here. Oh, bloody. I'll just switch my... <laughs> oh, dear. He's had a good night, anyway. Finally, Amal gets Eat enough it. coordination to put one foot in front of the other and heads off for a good night's sleep and a hangover in the morning. Next week on Police 107, two Hamilton 11-year-olds become repeat offenders. I mean, hey, we took you home last night because you guys were involved in a fight and then we catch you tonight in this building. It's not looking good, eh? A car drives past that should be at the wreckers. And a fight breaks out at a service station. There was nothing going on. Nothing going on, that's not what we're here.